Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, the number of independent voters requesting early ballots is up, and that has Republicans worried. And a new report shows that Arizona is number one in solar power capacity per capita. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Lawyers for Attorney General Tom Horn today tried to convince a judge to stop an investigation of Horn by the Arizona Clean Elections Commission. The commission is checking into allegations that Horn used state personnel and resources to work on his re-election campaign. Horn filed a lawsuit last month in an effort to block the investigation. Horn's lawyers claim that the case is under the jurisdiction of the Secretary of State's office and thus Clean Elections Commission has no authority to investigate. Well, the state Republican Party officials are expressing increasing concern over what looks to be a significant increase in the number of independent voters participating in this year's GOP primary election. Here to talk about those concerns and talk of closing the primary system by the 2016 election is Hank Stevenson of the Arizona Capital Times. Good to see you again. Uh, and, and great job on this. I know you, you wrote about this big time. That's why we got you here. Um, are independents increasingly going Republican side for this primary? I, I think they don't have much of a choice. If you're looking at the, the Democratic or the Republican ballot, um, statewide elections, you've got one contested primary in, on the Democratic side. Whereas on the, uh, on the Republican side, you've got a host of options from uh, governor, attorney general, attorney general on down the, the ticket. Uh, so yes, they're, they're going overwhelmingly for the GOP uh, ballot, but I don't think that's a real surprise given the, the dynamics of the two different primaries. So with that not being so much of a surprise, still Republicans are concerned. Yeah, and I think the, the big part of this is that uh, independent voters are turning out much more this year. Uh, we're already seeing some initial numbers, and it's kind of hard to get these to apples to, to apples. To apples. Um, but, it, but it's clear that the number of independents voting in the primary is going to spike this year. It could be two, three times as much here in Maricopa County, where the county recorder has been doing a lot of education efforts trying to dispel this widespread rumors uh, that, that independents can't vote in the primary election. And again, Republicans are concerned because according to the party officials here, what they're saying is uh, it has a moderating influence on the Republican Party. Yeah, uh, they're looking at guys like uh, Steve Smith, who's running for mayor, uh, or I'm sorry, the mayor of Mesa running for governor, uh, who, who's just a moderate Republican who they think is going to be winning overwhelmingly by the turnout of independence. If he goes on to win the election, it'll be due to the independent influence in the election. Are there other races that are of concern, or is this basically the governor's race is the one they're kind of looking at? That's that's the one where you've got a, a big field of six candidates. Uh, five of them are running to the right, pretty much a party platform down the line, and, and Scott Smith is the only one who's really breaking that mold, who's, who's kind of siding with Governor Jan Brewer on a host of issues, Common Core, Medicaid expansion, and, and that's the one that has people like uh, Maricopa County GOP Chair A.J. LaFaro worried about uh, independents nominating them through uh, the GOP to run on the general election ballot. I guess they don't want another situation like they had in Mississippi where they were courting Democrats down there in the open primary. The idea, I guess, for Republicans is they should think it'd be closed or at least limited to Republicans. Yeah, and right now, I mean, independents have the ability to choose a ballot. You can either choose the Democratic ballot or the Republican ballot. You kind of always hear these rumors that moderate Republicans are urging Democrats to re-register as independents and vote in the GOP primary. That, you know, I can't find any truth to those rumors necessarily, uh, but it's one of those things that has uh, Republican loyals uh, very worried that that could have an influence on who gets nominated as the Republican uh, candidate. How worried are they? are they? Because I'm I'm hearing now talk of trying to get maybe the legislature to do something before the 2016 election to close the primary. What are we? What's going on here? Yeah, there's there's a, uh, an increasing conversation about this, uh, both at the state level and here in Maricopa County. The party has uh, passed resolution saying we should close down our primaries to not allow independents to vote in the GOP primary. Uh, that's kind of getting a backlash from a lot of people who say, look, if we don't have independents voting in the Republican primary, we're relying on them come the general election to boost our candidate uh, up over the 50% mark. 
uh, if they don't have a say in the, the Republican primary, then what incentive is there for them to go out and vote for a Republican in November? I was going to say independents can just turn around and say, you're going to need us one way or the other. Yeah, they're the largest voting bloc in Arizona right now. I mean, outnumbering uh, Democrats and Republicans. So it's really changing the way that campaigns are run. They're even, uh, I'm hearing talk of a caucus system. I mean, you talk about closed. This is closed within closed here. Wouldn't that alienate the rank and file Republican voters? Obviously independents as well, but if you go to a caucus system where precinct committeemen and, and chair people are the only ones going, you know, deciding on candidates, that doesn't sound all that inclusive. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because there's a handful of ideas uh, floating out there about how to do this. Caucus system is one of them. Nobody's really nailed down what the best method is, but that's probably as closed as you can get where you're having the actual precinct committeemen uh, the, the people who have the time and uh, the inclination to be heavily involved in the party, just handpicking the uh, nominees for the, the Republican side for November, um, it, it would lead to more likely than not uh, very strong conservative candidates, which I think a lot of people want to see. But I, I think the middle of the road Arizona residents are going to have a hard time uh, agreeing with the most loyal Republican Party Faithful. And not only that, it wouldn't reflect the electorate for the Republican Party. I mean, you got lots of folks out there that are Republicans that may not agree with their precinct chair people. Exactly. I, I think that's going to be a big pushback against this idea. Uh, but so far, I mean, both the Maricopa County and the state party has passed resolutions endorsing this idea in one form or another, whether it's a mm. caucus system or whether it's just allowing Republican voters to have a say in the GOP primary. As far as turnout is concerned, how much do independents usually turn out in primaries. And again, from what you said earlier, we're seeing a very big change this go around. Yeah, usually it's uh, abysmally low, somewhere around 7%, where maybe the average is 28, 30% statewide uh, turnout in a primary. Um, independents just don't show up. And a lot of that goes back to the misconception that they cannot vote in primary elections. Uh, independents have to request a ballot from the county recorders, whereas if you're on the permanent early voting list as a Democrat or a Republican, you're automatically sent a ballot. Uh, this year, we're already seeing signs that this is going to be spiking hugely. Um, there are about 75,000 independents uh, in Maricopa County alone who have requested early ballots already. About 45,000 of those are uh, Republicans, are independents requesting Republican ballots. And by comparison, if you're looking at just early voting numbers in the 2012 election, you had about 14,000, 15,000 independents asking for Republican ballots. So that, that's, that's an easy doubling, and we could see it continue wow. to increase as they have until Friday to request a ballot. And independents can go to the polls on election day, which is a huge point. Yeah, they go to the poll. They ask you which one you want. You tell them what you want. You go and make your decisions. Um, where are Democrats in all this? And I ask this because... In the end, do Democrats want more moderate Republicans on the ballot challenging their candidates? Yeah, there's a couple of different thoughts on that. I mean, one idea is, you know, Democrats have, have for years, kept their candidates to a minimum. Uh, they, they don't have contentious primaries here in the state, and that allows them to get an early head start on the general election in November. Uh, some of them think, you know, maybe we should uh, let the, the Republican Party just close down their ballot or their primary and w our candidates will have a much easier time uh, collecting the majority of votes come November versus, you know, what is likely to be the most uh, conservative candidate that could be chosen from the from the Republican field. Uh, that's what the, the PCs are going to nominate if it comes to that. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because you, you hear from Democrats, some of them think, you know, Scott Smith, that would be great, and others say, no, it wouldn't be great because it would hurt their candidates. Exactly. Uh, a Scott Smith, Fred Duvall matchup would, would be very tough for Democrats to win, whereas if, uh, you know, Al Melvin, who's already dropped out, or, you know, one of the more extreme conservative candidates is put up as the Republican nominee, uh, Democrats are really hoping that, you know, something like that happens and gives them uh, a chance to win at least a uh, statewide office like that. Last question. It seems as though historically independents, oddly enough, show an independent streak when it comes to vote. You never really know where independents are going to go. That still has to be into play. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, independence is not a party. Uh, there is no party ideology. It's people who don't align with either the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, or who just want to, you know, declare their independence from there. But there are some things we can say about independence. By, by registering as an independent, you are, you know, declaring yourself independent. So they go for like-minded candidates, candidates who are willing to break their party's platform, whether it be on the Democratic or the Republican side. Uh, that's kind of the, the, the usual thing thinking about uh, independence and for some to some degree we're seeing some polls uh, not necessarily totally scientific that that back that that they are going overwhelmingly for for mr. Smith um, in the Republican primary interesting all right good stuff good story thanks for being here we appreciate it thanks for having me Ted. Expand your horizon with the Arizona Horizon website. To get there, go to azpbs.org. Click on the Arizona Horizon tab at the top of the screen. Once there, you can access many features. Watch interviews by clicking on the video button. You can also find out what's on Arizona Horizon for the coming week. If you would like an RSS feed, a podcast, or want to buy a video, that's all on the website too. Want to learn about specific topics like immigration or the legislature? You can visit our special web sections. Show your support for Arizona Horizon at azpbs.org slash Arizona Horizon. Tonight's look at Arizona's sustainability issues focuses on solar power. A new national report shows Arizona is first in the nation in solar power capacity per capita. Here to explain what that means and where the state goes from here is Brett Fanshaw of Environment Arizona. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Ted. Uh, the, the report is titled Lighting the Way. What did the report look at? Sure. So the Lighting the Way report looked at the top 10 states for installed solar across the whole country. And then we broke it down for how much solar that means per person. And for Arizona, we were number one in terms of the amount of solar we had in the state per person. So basically when, when Arizona is number one for solar capacity per capita, that means how much each of us can use, will use, should use? So that means, uh, well, it depends how you look at it, but I, for this report, it's just the total amount of megawatts of solar that's installed in the state divided by the number of people in the state. Okay, yep. so, uh, and it's, it sounds like from the report, Arizona is among 10 states that account for like 20% of electricity consumption. Talk to us about that. Yeah, that's right. So 20% of electricity consumption, but we have 87% of the total amount of solar that's installed uh, out of the entire country. So what so. do we take from that? Well, I think there's a number of policies that the report looks at that states like Arizona have put in place that have put us on this path to being at the top of the list. Let's talk about some of those policies. The impact of net metering. First of all, quickly give us a description and explanation of what net metering is and how much that impacts a report like this. Sure. So net metering is one of the policies we have in Arizona that allows someone who has solar on their roof to get credit for the excess amount of electricity they put back uh, into the grid. And so there's a market rate that is decided. And you're right, there, there's been a lot of debate about net metering and it's, it's a little unclear on, on how, how whether this report um, shows the effects of those debate yet. So we might actually see those effects next year because the numbers for this report go through the end of calendar year 2013 and that the start of 2014 is when some of those net metering changes um, took place. And I would say even the debate regarding net metering must mean at least a little bit of uncertainty in the marketplace. Sure, I, I think that is what we're hearing from folks in the solar industry. Um, and the, the debate at the 
commission has unfortunately continued to happen. And so they reopened the renewable energy rules this year, mostly to look at compliance. Mm -hmm. I know you had Amanda Ormond on to talk about that at the beginning of the year. And they're going to be coming to a decision on that this fall. But I think you're right. I think we need to look at how can we make Arizona really the number one place to you know, have solar energy. And from our perspective at Environment Arizona, so that we have a cleaner environment. Um, and, and have less of these debates. So, okay, so net metering obviously is something that has pushed, uh, pushed the solar power uh, policy forward. We mentioned renewable energy standards. That has to be a biggie. That's probably the biggest one, Ted. So the renewable energy standard for Arizona is 15% clean energy by 2025. And all the top 10 states that we looked at in this report have some kind of renewable energy standard on the books. So that is a really big policy. Uh, within that, we also have uh, a small carve out for solar energy, so for rooftop solar, which is 30% of that 15, so four and a half mm -hmm. overall, um, has to come from uh, distributed generation is what it's called. We've had people on the program, we say that's all fine and dandy, but the standards are still too low. You agree with that? I do agree with that. I think you look at places like California and Colorado that have higher renewable energy standards than we do, and there's certainly room for us to grow. And some people have even said since the report came out that Arizona's overcounted a little bit because California actually owns some of Arizona's solar energy. And so mm -hmm. uh, we counted all the solar that's in the state, but you know, some of it uh, California gets the credit for because they have a higher renewable energy standard. What is the impact of interconnection A and B, before we even get to A, let's get to minus A, what is interconnection? So interconnection policy is something that allows, so when you decide to put solar up on your roof, uh, there's a certain set of standards as to how you can plug that solar energy into the grid. And here in Arizona, you have to do that through a utility company, so like through APS or someone like that. Um, and in other states, there are easier ways to connect simply to the grid rather than going through that process. So basically, we don't have the kind of interconnection standards other states have? That's right, we don't, and uh, we're one of the only states out of the top 10 that doesn't have a strong interconnection policy. So we're a leader in solar energy. If you're looking for ways to improve that leadership, that would be one of them, I would imagine? Sure, exactly. So an in, in improved uh, interconnection policy, uh, an increased renewable energy standard, and just to touch base on that a little bit more, one of the interesting places that uh, we've made some progress on and there's been progress made on solar has been at the local level. So if you look at a city like Tempe, for example, just passed a clean energy standard for government operations in Tempe uh, of 20% by 2025. So they're going a little bit above the, the state standard. And um, I think there's opportunities for other cities across Arizona to do the same thing. And you mentioned Tempe. I mean, Arizona State University, there are solar panels everywhere oh, on yeah. the campus. I mean, you can't find a parking area without <clears throat> being covered by panels. Yeah, exactly. Michael Crow and ASU has done a lot to put solar, um, solar on the grid there. Well, what about APS and their plans now? They have plans for their own rooftop solar. What mm -hmm. is that all about? Um, I don't know some of the specifics, but I know that they are looking for ways to help homeowners to put solar up, which is great. Um, and I think it's, it is a little interesting to see APS, um, you know, it makes sense for them to go that route, but it's a little interesting based on some of the policies they've put forward to roll back net metering at the Corporation Commission yeah, last and year. And again, when you see that, when you see the policies here, yet you see we're going to get into the business there and I think save uh, uh, cons mm -hmm. customers like $30 a month in electric bills mm -hmm. or something along for that particular standard, it's kind of, it seems like a little bit of uncertainty there. I think there is, and I think it's a little bit of you know, APS is looking at how can it benefit itself uh, a little bit more than, I think people are saving more than $30 a month mm -hmm. uh, on their average system size, so. What can Arizona, obviously we're in the top 10 and we're number one as far as per capita, but there's still a ways to go here. What can Arizona learn from other states? You mentioned interconnection. What other things can we learn from others? Or are we just, is everyone else looking at us? <laughs> I think it's a two-way street. I think, I think both of those things are happening. 
Um, I think Arizona can increase its renewable energy standard. We can learn that from other places like California and Colorado. I think we have opportunities to increase the way that we finance solar energy. So one thing that has been put forward at the legislature the last couple of years is something called PACE, which is Property Assessed Clean Energy. And it's a way for um, homeowners to finance solar at a lower cost. And so even though cost of solar has gone down quite a lot, the report shows uh, it's gone down 60% since 2011. So a lot more people are able to get it. There are still some policies we can enact that will help that help move that along. Greatest challenge now, as far as solar energy in Arizona is concerned, the greatest concern, the greatest challenge, the biggest speed bump. What's out there? Um, certainly not our sunshine. <laughs> uh, we have plenty of that. I think it's the will of our political decision makers to take solar energy on and to put forward some of the policies we've outlined. Um, like increasing the renewable energy standard, like helping people go uh, for uh, low-cost financing options for solar. I think those are going to be some of the, the bigger speed bumps uh, as we go along. And I think we'll see if Arizona can keep up with some of these other states that have bigger policies than we do uh, as we continue to put this report out. And you put the report out, Environment Arizona. What is Environment Arizona? Yeah, Environment Arizona is a statewide citizen-based environmental advocacy organization. We work on many different issues, clean air, clean water, and open space. Lately, solar energy has been a really big issue for us, and so that's why we put out this report. And, the rep and if I'm a lawmaker, if I'm a policymaker, uh, a decision maker, what do you want me to take from this report? Well, I think there's a lot of good policies within the report that uh, we can apply here in Arizona, whether you're at the Corporation Commission or at the state legislature, or even if uh, uh, you're a mayor of a city. I, I think, you know, Mark Mitchell uh, took a big step when he put forward the, the policy in Tempe to, for them to get 20 percent of their power from clean energy. And there's lots of opportunities in Phoenix and Mesa and Tucson and all kinds of places to do that, too. All right. Well, very good, Brett. Good to have you here. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, hear from an ASU researcher who developed a treatment now being used on two Ebola virus patients. And it's our monthly science update with ASU physicist Lawrence Krauss. That's Tuesday on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.